Good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for joining me today. My mom is sitting here and my wife, Nancy, is sitting here with me. I really appreciate the time you're taking out of your day to join me in prayer and the reading of a psalm. Today we're looking at Psalm 13. It's a lament, a wail to God to be heard. So let's begin with prayer today. Kind and merciful Father, I thank you for the beauty of creation all around us, the beauty of oceans, the beauty of the sound of ocean waves, the beauty of spring flowers and bird song, the wonder of just a sunny day with yet snow-clad mountains in the distance. Beautiful trees, evergreen trees all around us, shouting out praises to God. All creation sings your glory, Lord. All creation sings your glory. Father, in the quiet of these moments, I pray that we remember you. I pray that we would remember how powerful you are, how great you are, how compassionate and loving and kind you are. I pray that we would remember your grace towards us, that we have received grace upon grace, grace in place of grace. Just like ocean waves that come crashing in, your grace, that undeserved, unmerited, kind power, kind and generous power of God to forgive, transform, and save broken and sinful lives, Lord. That grace comes crashing into our lives. And as one wave recedes, Lord, you send another wave of grace. But to be frank, Lord, and honestly, sometimes it seems like the expanse between the waves is longer than it should be. We know your grace is always sufficient for us. It never stops coming. We just can't see it. And so, Lord, in these days, Give us the power of your grace, the knowledge of your love. I pray that we would know how wide and long and high and deep was the love of Christ. Together with Paul, I pray, dear God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may you give to us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you. I pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened so that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of your power towards us who believe. For this reason I bow my knees before you, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that you would grant to each one of us listening and to those who will be listening later and all those in our church and in the churches we attend, that you would grant to us according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with power through your Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to the fullness of God. So, Father, we ask that you would again strengthen us with power in our inner being through your Spirit, so that three things, so that we would realize three things in our life, Christ living in our hearts, living uh, in our lives, that we would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love surpasses that surpasses knowledge, 
and that you would empower us by your Spirit so that we might be filled up with the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, for everyone listening, I pray that you would make that love real to them today, this week, this month, even in the midst of this pandemic when we wonder what you are doing, where, where you are. I pray that we would all know your love, that we would all know your sustaining grace, that we would all know your understanding surpassing peace. I looked up the numbers this morning, Lord, and there's five, 500,000 or 580,000 rough, roughly, 580,000 people who are, have now contracted COVID-19 in our country. And of that, there's 22,000 people who have died, 22,252 people who have died so far. It's a staggering loss of life when you do the calculations and figure out the death rate, the, case, the known case death rate, Lord. And so we cry out to you, Lord, to deliver our world from this. That's our request. That's our, our cry. But I sense a deep, deeper word from your spirit. That all of us would be about praying Jesus' garden prayer. that in the midst of this pandemic, not as we will, not as we request, but as you will, Lord. I can't pretend to know what your will is in the midst of this, other than I know you love the world and you're drawing the world to yourself. Please don't harden the world's heart, Lord. Please don't let our hearts be hardened. But Father, our resolute prayer, our firm prayer, our, pray, our prayer prayed with conviction is not our will, but your will be done. And in that prayer, we find certain and sure hope and certain and sure peace. I know it full well in my own life, Lord. I want it my way. But my way is always infinitely less than your way, than your will. And so it really comes down to, are we trusting you to have it your way in the midst of this pandemic. I know that families are grieving all around the world. There are those who are sick who can't be surrounded by family in the hospital, people on ventilators. Comfort those who mourn, Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth. So are your words above our words and your thoughts above our thoughts. So forgive us for wanting to understand when this is beyond our understanding. But we know that you are good. That your glory still shines down on us. That you are loving and kind I pray that your kindness would lead the world to repentance. Father, we pray that your kindness would lead the world to repentance. Not as we will, but as you will, Lord. Not as we will. But as you will, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
Again, thank you for joining me today. I was praying this morning, asking God, what do I need to pray about today? And he spoke to me quietly in my spirit that my will be, will be done, that God's will, will, will be done. It's a bold prayer, but it's the only prayer we have where we know we can dwell in safety and security no matter what happens. So join with me in praying, not my will, but your will be done. Today we're looking at Psalm 13, and it's one of the most honest, brutally honest psalms in all of the 150 psalms that we have. It's purported to be a psalm of David. It says it in uh, versions that this is a psalm of David. Directions to the choir that it's a psalm of David. I don't know quite what that means other than it was a uh, instruction to the Levitical choir who would be singing. And But it is a psalm of David. We don't know the circumstances of the psalm. There's no explanation of it. Whether it's a physical en el uh, enemy, whether he's uh, ill again, as in the last couple of psalms where it, looks, it appears that he was struggling with some kind of physical illness. But let's first read through the psalm and then we will uh, take a uh, closer look at it. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul having sorrow in my heart all the day. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. So we begin Psalm 13. It's a lament, and a lament is defined as a psalm that is basically a, a, an out loud mourning or a wail a wail to God, wailing to him. Uh, it expresses sorrow, mourning, or regret. And here the regret is because God doesn't seem to be uh, present. So it says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Um, so we have a lament. A lament, in, in another sense, is a form of complaint. He's complaining to God in a very brutally honest fashion. Where are you, God? And so when it says, how long, O Lord, that O Lord, again, we know is the, the name Yahweh, and we can attribute that to Jesus. How long, Jesus, will you forget me forever? That phrase, will you forget me forever, is a Jewish or a Hebrew idiom. An idiom is a way of saying things, a turn of phrase, like to brighten one's eyes is, a, is an American idiom, having your eyes brightened. Uh, here we have, will you forget me forever? It means, will you forget me? Will you go on and on forgetting me? Will you go on and on forgetting me? Have you ever felt like that, where heaven is just steeled over? Where God is no, nowhere present in your life? I've had that feeling several times in my life. Once during uh, the passing of my mother from cancer. Sometimes during the midst of my struggle with cancer now, I have that feeling, but not very often. But it comes, usually at night, in the middle of the night, when I wake up to the thought, I have cancer. I know many of you are struggling with different maladies or illnesses, griefs, shattered relationships, children who are addicted. The list goes on and on. And we pray to God, and we pray to God, and we ask, And there seems to be no answer. He doesn't seem to be listening. It would appear he's turned his face from us. He's turned his attention from us. And so I love the brutal honesty of, of this question. 
Can we be just as brutally honest as David? I think that's the purpose of this psalm being here, is to give us license, if you will. It gives us permission to rail at God, to take up our case before him and say, you've forgotten me, God, where are you? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Hiding your face uh, also was a Hebrew idiom, which meant that the one who is turning their face from, from you or from us is turning their face or his face. God is turning his face because he has now disdain for us. He has uh, abandoned us. He's rejected us. At least it feels that way. How long will you turn your face? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will you hold me in disdain, abandon, abandon me and rejecting me? Such brutal honesty with God. I think sometimes we complain to each other when where we should be going with our complaint is to God himself. It's kind of scary, isn't it? You expect lightning to come down and strike you for saying some of the things that David is saying in this, in this psalm and in this prayer. How long, O oh Lord? In the midst of this pandemic, how long, O oh Lord? Will you, forget, get, will you forget us forever? Will you go on and on forgetting us? How long will you hide your face from us? And then David says, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? And so what he means by that, he's taking counsel from his soul, in his soul. He's not getting counsel from God. He's not getting direction, wisdom, guidance. And so the only counsel he has is his soul, which is made up of his mind, will, and emotions. And then it tells us what that counsel is. Having sorrow in my heart all day long. The only thing that is giving me any counsel right now is this in intense and deep sorrow that I have that follows me and is with me all through the day and all through the night. Sorrow is not a very good counselor. Sorrow is not a very good guide. It leads us to thoughts of despair, depression. How long shall I take counsel in my soul? having sorrow in my heart all the day long. And here again, heart is both his mind and his emotions, that inner being of David. Have you ever been like a dog with a bone where you chew on that worry or that concern or that sorrow? I lived in sorrow over my, my mother's death for 10 years. Let it fester. I was being a miser of grief, hoarding the grief in my life. Letting that sorrow be my counselor. I fell then into self-pity. I love to have people feel sorry for me. It's like a, my third drug. Alcohol, marijuana, well, fourth drug, cocaine, and self-pity. It's a dangerous drug, folks. How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart all day long. There's no joy. There's no smile on David's face. It's a place of deep depression, of deep lament, of deep mourning. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? We don't know if this is Saul or Absalom. We know it's a physical enemy because of what he says uh, in the next two verses. But it could very well lend itself to other kinds of enemies, Satan and his cohorts, for sure. How long will, they, will my enemy be exalted over me? or the consequence of his work in my life, such as cancer. It could be illness. Uh, illness is certainly our enemy. It could be approaching death is our enemy. And notice what it says, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? That's the place where God normally is exalted in David's life and in our lives, where God is the one who is looking at us and who, to whom we look for our protection, our provision, our safety, 
our instruction, our guidance, our counsel. But now it's the enemy that has seemingly taken the place of God. He's the one who is exalted over David's life, and God is nowhere to be found. Sometimes it feels that way in the midst of this pandemic. This pandemic, this little virus, is our enemy. How long, O oh Lord, will you go on forgetting us? Will you go on and on forgetting us? How long will you hide your face from us, Lord? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in our hearts all the day long? How long will our enemy be exalted over us? God, you should be the one who's exalted over us. So David is giving a lament, giving this heartfelt honest complaint to God. I don't think we're very honest with God about how we feel. Maybe that he's abandoned us, that he's rejected us. And it's the very thing that God desires you to bring to him. He's big enough to handle it. He created you. He gave you those emotions. And so we come to him with brutally honest hearts. It's one thing I love about Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and Narcotics Anonymous meetings is you are confronted with brutal honesty. And those who aren't brutal, brutally honest, they tend to get called on the carpet sometimes. Or their lying becomes apparent to the whole group. I've heard such stories that beggar the imagination of people coming to take full responsibility of their lives for the damage they've done to their children for the damage they've done to their own spouses and to their own lives. I've been there. Sometimes we make people uncomfortable because of our brutal honesty. But there's one place you can always be brutally honest to. There's one person to whom you can always be brutally honest. And that is God himself, Yahweh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he moves into the second section, the verses 3 and 4. Consider me, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries, my enemies, will rejoice when I am shaken. And so we come to a prayer. This is where he turns it to request. He's moved from lament and complaint now to prayer and more specifically petition. A petition is an earnest in, uh, inquiry, an earnest request, something we are begging God to do, such as in this pandemic, aren't we begging God to put an end to it, to put an end so that there will be uh, no more loss of life, no more families grieving, no more uh, children who have lost their parents, sisters and brothers, grandparents, and so it's this heartfelt petition, this cry out to God. And he says, consider and answer me. And that word consider is literally the word to look. You've been looking away. You've been turned away from us, God. Now look towards us. Look at us and answer me. Consider and answer me. And so he's almost demanding of God. It's an imperative here. It's a command. He's commanding God, answer me, O God, O Lord, my God. What boldness! You want to go, okay, I want to move away from him a little bit here. David, you're going to get zapped by lightning. An earthquake's going to happen. You're going to get uh, smoted. No. God desires our honesty. Consider me, or consider and answer us, O Lord, our God. Yahweh. Our Elohim is what it's saying. Enlighten my eyes. Again, this is a, a Jewish or a Hebrew idiom in the Hebrew language uh, from biblical days. It means to restore the sparkle. Oh, no, that's not the one. Yes, it means to restore the sparkle in my eyes. That would be our way of saying it. It means to brighten my eyes. When you're sick, your eyes become dull. You, you kind of become lethargic depressed, and David's asked God, 
Enlighten my eyes. Restore the brightness to my eyes. Restore me to health. It's a Hebrew way of saying restore me to health. I was thinking that it might be also a, 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 a wordplay here where David is getting at two things. Bring the brightness back to my eyes while also giving me understanding. And, and some people I read suggest that. But then, right, the very next thing he says is, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And so I think very much it's restore me to health. Give me that brightness in my eyes. Return the vigor to my life. What a prayer for me. What a prayer for us in the midst of this pandemic. Consider and answer us, O Lord, our God. Enlighten our, our, our eyes. Put the, spar the sparkle back in our eyes. Or we will sleep the sleep of death. Here, David likens death to sleep, uh, maybe uh, indirect reference to the hope of resurrection. But notice he, he gives his petition, his prayer, and then he gives three reasons to God. He's arguing with God. He's taking that bold step of actually arguing with God, giving him three reasons for which God should answer his prayer. First, if you don't answer me, I'm going to be dead, God, and what good am I to you then? Secondly, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him. My enemy has been exalted over me where you should be over me. And if you let him win, then he's going to boast that he, ex he has had the victory over my life when you should have had the victory, God. Where are you? You better show up. And then the third reasons, or the third reason, and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. And that shaken means uh, having died, whether from illness or because they've caught him and killed him. So three reasons. If you don't show up, God, if you don't turn your attention, if you don't look to, to us, if you don't look to me, I'm going to be and I'm going to end up dead and I'm going to be of no use to you. And then my enemies will boast that they've overcome me, that they've had a victory over my life, and that they will be rejoicing in place of me rejoicing. I should be the one rejoicing in your showing up and your delivering me, but instead you're going to be giving them cause for rejoicing. And he puts this all on in God's plate, on his plate, in his lap. What brutal honesty. I want to get back again and say, wow, do you feel comfortable praying like this in the midst of your turmoils, your stresses, your afflictions? your shattered relationships when the world around you seems to be breaking down? Can we go to God and be brutally honest? How long, O oh Lord? How long? And so then we move from lament and complaint to prayer, this petition. And then we move to the last two verses. And we read, But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And so if you notice something about this, the first thing he does is he brings to remembrance his past. So he remembers, but I have trusted in your loving kindness. He's remembering the times in his life before that God has been faithful to him and that he trusted God. And it's in his loving kindness, which brings up that David is in covenant with God. And so all of this, this whole psalm is born out of this idea of being in covenant with God. God has promised that he would be our protector, that he would be there for us, that he would be our shield, that he would be our great reward, that he would be our all in all. And now, God, it seems like you have departed us. It seems like you disdained us. It seems like you have uh, rejected and abandoned us. In the midst of the calamity, we find ourselves in the midst of the pain and turmoil and grief. David can't look forward until he looks backwards. And what he does is he says, but I have trusted in your covenant love, that hesed, long-suffering love that never gives up. And so what he's getting at is that hesed love, Lord, your hesed love is still with me. I remembered it in the past, so may it be with me now in my day today and in my future. 
And so he remembers. And if you notice the, at the last line, because he has dealt bountifully with me, remembering back to when he has dealt bountifully with David in the past. Boy, in my cer cer present circumstance, sometimes I feel like God has steeled over heaven. But then I remember back to all the times he's been so kind and gracious to me, delivering me from unspeakable sin, delivering me from the wickedness of my own hand and the inability of my own will to ever choose the right course. And I remember that all through my life, he has been my all in all. So that whatever is happening now, I can pray, not my will, but your will be done. And in that prayer, I find the under, understanding surpassing peace that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There's one point where he's making that division of our hearts, our innermost being, the, the seed of him, our mind, will, and emotions. But I have trusted in your loving kindness, remembrance. And then he moves to trust, remembering. Because he remembers that he trusted God in the past, he remembers that he can trust him now. That's the implication of it. He's moving from lament into petition, into remembrance, and then to trust. And a result, as a result of restored trust, notice what he does. He moves into worship. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I'll return to rejoicing in your deliverance when you deliver this me from this. He's thanking him ahead of time for the deliverance that's coming. I will sing to the Lord. Right now he's on a bed of lament, a bed of sorrow and mourning and grief. But when he remembers that God has been so faithful to him in the past, then he returns to trust in God, and out of that place of trust, the song of praise, the worship of the wonder of who God is, and what he can do, what he has done, what he can do, and what he will yet do. A Hebrew person never found hope by looking forward. They always found hope by looking to the past, by remembering the past, and remembering God's faithfulness in the past. When you're in the midst of calamity, when you're in the midst of affliction, when you're in the midst of illness, it's hard to think that God is going to be kind to me and benevolent to me in these coming days when all I'm experiencing now, all we're experiencing now is this hardship and trial. And so this psalm instructs us to look backwards and to remember when God was there, when he was so clearly there in our life. Always, I have always said that we can't usually see God working in our life in the moment. I don't see him in the moment. But I see him in the wake of my life. I see it in the wake of his grace. Just like a motorboat going by and you see that wake afterwards and so you know the motorboat's been there. In the same way when God moves in my life, I can see the waves of change in my life and the waves of deliverance and the waves of peace and the waves of joy. And I know he's been there in my life because it's something I could never produce in, in of myself. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He has dealt with abundance in my life. I think about my own life, what he's forgiven me for all that perverse living in the fraternity. There's stories, I, there's no point in telling those stories. It's just casting up our fo the foam of our shame. Those, sometimes those stories haunt me. Even today, sitting at the breakfast table, I remembered back, a, a, a memory popped in my mind about a particularly unsettling day when I was full of pride. When I, was at a, when I was at a Bible camp in Riding Mountain National Park in Saskatchewan when I was a missionary. Such pride, such ugly pride. And maybe it wasn't the enemy reminding me of that. I think it was the Lord reminding of me of that to keep me from pride. It's an ugly thing. And so in the midst of this calamity, we have 
in the midst of this, this pestilence, if you will, in the midst of this pandemic. Take courage and raise your lament, raise your wail to God. It might not have anything to do with the pandemic. It might be to do with the other circumstances in your life. We all had stresses and, and a lot of trouble in our day prior to this ever happening. But begin with lament. Let your wail be known. Give your wail to God. Give your mourning, your grief. You can even yell at him. Find a secluded place and let your wail be heard. And then move from there into this demand to be heard. This petition, this entreaty, this heartfelt prayer. And, and if you can think up the reasons for why God shouldn't, uh, why he should listen to you. And then we move from lament to petition into remembering his faithfulness in the past, returning to a place of trust in our life now, a trust in God, and we move into worship. And we conclude with remembering what marvelous, wondrous things the Lord has done in our lives. Look where he's moved you from. Look where he's moved me from. That transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm reminded of the words from our text two Sundays ago from 2 Corinthians. It says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, our outer person is decaying, yet our inner pers person is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing, is achieving for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, they're time-bound, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So even in the midst of our lament, we can be reminded that he has destined us for an eternity with him and, and an eternity together as family, as eternal friends. Thank you for joining me today. You are my eternal friends. We are eternal friends. I'm sorry you're stuck with me forever. Except for when we get to heaven, we'll be all perfect. We won't have our idiosyncrasies, our sinful, the easily entangling sins that we so readily fall into. Learn to let your wail be heard. Learn to lament. God delights in our being brutally honest with him. He delights in you being brutally honest with him. Let your heartfelt cries, your heartfelt petitions be heard. And then remember what he's done, how he's been faithful to you in the past, knowing then that he will be faithful to me in the presence and I can trust him, leading me once again to worship him because he is an awesome God. He is an awesome God. I know it full well because I see it in the wake of my life, because I see it in the wake of his grace. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me for noontime prayer in the reading of Psalm 13. I wish I could be with you in, in person. I very much appreciate your willingness to sequester, to quarantine. My wife and family and daughter and, and mom now, we have been quarantined for over a month now because we started 14 days before the order came because of potentially getting exposed to it through our daughter. We didn't come down with it. Nicole didn't come down with it. So this is going on over a month now. And it seems so peculiar. Everything shut down by this little virus. But in the midst of it, remember to lament, to pray, to, to give your petition, 
and then to remember. And in the midst of it, remember Jesus' garden prayer. I think it's the most powerful prayer we can ever pray. Not our will. Not my will. But your will be done. Let's close in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and the power and the glory. For thine is a kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Not as we will, Lord, but as you will. Now from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. I'll be back tomorrow at noon with noontime prayer in Psalm 14. And then I won't be here on Thursday because I have another meeting I need to be at and then back again Friday. May the peace of Christ and the grace of Christ be always with you. Amen. Thanks for joining me today.